I want to welcome everyone to our Friday night live Bible study. This is your time out, time out from the world, time to get into the Word of God, sit back and relax, and do one of the greatest things that a person could possibly do, and that's gain a greater knowledge of our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we've been noticing that the Word of God says, and we might look at this further, tonight the Word of God says that uh, His Word is spiritually discerned. His Word is not understood with our mind. It's understood with our spirit, and our spirit then illuminates it or makes it known or understood by our reasoning, our mind, our thinking. But his word is spirit and it is life and it ministers life to our spirits. Well, we'll get into that some as we get further into tonight's study. What I want to do is I want us to start off, in light of what we just said, I want us to start off with a simple prayer. And it's a prayer to make sure that we are in spiritual contact with our Heavenly Father, with the Holy Spirit, and with our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, if you'll just follow after me, we'll say this prayer and then get into our study. God, God I, come to you. I come to you. I come to you according to your word. I come to you according to your, word. your word says, your word says in, the in the book of Romans, chapter 10, chapter 10 verse, 9, verse 9, that if I will confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead, that I shall be saved. God, Right now, with my mouth, I confess that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. So according to your word, with my mouth, I've made a confession unto salvation. And with my heart, I have believed unto right standing with you. For your word says that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And right now, I'm calling on the name of Jesus for my salvation. So I thank you, Father, that I shall be saved. And I thank you in the name of our Lord, our God, our Savior, and our King, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, glory to God. I'm hoping that if you prayed that prayer with me, that uh, you'll come to, and hoping and believing, that you will come to a full realization that something special has taken place inside of you. And that this word that you're going to hear studied, the scriptures that you hear studied, that you're here to study, will be uh, just come to life for you. That they'll mean something other than just words from a book or words on a page. Jesus promised us that his words were spirit and they were life. And I'm believing that life is eternal life, that his words are. Our text scriptures, well, before we get to our text scripture, I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed last week's Bible study. We had questions that were being asked and hopefully answered. At the, we're going to do that again at the latter part of, the, of today's study. I'm believing we can take the last 15 minutes and devote it to questions if you have any. If not, I have plenty of material here that we can continue teaching and learning. But that time is special for you. So if you've got your Bible, get your paper and a pencil and, and uh, start taking notes. Mark up your Bible. Highlight it. Put arrows to things that are special to you. Put an asterisk at the top of the page to let you know it's something special on that page, and then put an asterisk by the verse. Get your own way of marking your Bible so that you can come back to this material 
it becomes precious, your Bible becomes precious because it's a study tool to learn and gain a knowledge of our Heavenly Father and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I also want you to be made aware that uh, on the write-up for the Bible study, there's several links on there. One link you can download uh, you can download the study notes for tonight's Bible study. Uh, there's another link there to a video that uh, Pastor Jackie, my wife, uh, prepared that will give you additional information about what we're going to study tonight. There's another uh, PDF file that you can download. That's a great tool for witnessing it has the slides on it that uh, we're going to be going over tonight. We're going to go over some slides. And uh, we'll be going to these slides from time to time because they have a great meaning and it's kind of a visual aid to help us to remember and to understand and to get a picture of, of what took place when, when, when God created the world and he created man and the state of man and, and what God's desire for man is. They're very simple slides. But the scriptures behind the slides are profound. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to our text scripture, which is found in first, uh, Second Peter, in uh, chapter... One, and we're going to start reading in verse two. Now we might, in fact, we are going to we're going to read a little further than our our text scriptures are really verses two, three, and four. But we might read through verse eight or nine. Verse two, Second Peter chapter one, verse two. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. That's such a wonderful set of scriptures. That we have. First off, we see at the beginning that it's through knowledge. See, our lesson, our Bible study is really on wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And those three are so closely related. And here, these scriptures talk about that we can have everything that we want in life by obtaining the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's important to note as we go through here in the second verse, it says, uh, grace and peace be multiplied to you. How? Through the knowledge of God. In verse 3, it says uh, that we can have everything, all things that pertain to life and godliness. We can have that. How? Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. It says, and whereby, it says, whereby is referring to the knowledge are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these these exceeding great and precious promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature. That divine nature means that when you get a knowledge of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can start doing the things that God and our Lord Jesus has done and are doing. You can become a partaker of God's divine nature. What awesome words! 
In God's nature, we see from the beginning is that when he wants something, he says something. And through the course of this study, we're going to look at how important it is for us to say the right things. And it goes on, it says uh, that we, through this knowledge, we can escape the corruption that is in the world, the corruption that came in when Adam sinned, that corruption that was caused by the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. It says you can escape it. You've been trying to get your life right and wondering why you lust after this and lust after that. And you try to repent, and you do repent. You change your mind, you change your thinking, and you find out that after a while, the same lust of the eyes or lust of the flesh or lust of the eyes is back on you again, and you wonder why you can't break out of this and why you can't stop sinning and keep doing this over and over again. It's not that you can't, it's that you're using the wrong method you're trying to do it religiously, and I mean that word, and I want to put emphasis on it. You're trying to do it religiously, and that's the wrong way to accomplish what it is that you want to accomplish. Your heart tugs at you to live a life that's in line with how God wants you to live. And you'll seek, and those of you out there, I know you're out there, that seek to get this accomplished through religion and religions absolutely will not get it done. In fact, it actually has a reverse effect. And we'll explain that later as we go through our Bible studies. But then it has here in verse 5, it says, And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. And verse 6, And to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness and the godliness, brotherly kindness, and the brotherly kindness, charity. And in verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, they make that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you go back through those scriptures and count it, you'll see that in that few, those few verses, the word knowledge is in there five times. Now it's real interesting because that word knowledge that's in there all those times is not the same Greek word. Two times it's in there meaning to know, to understand, really to know and understand God. That's why we're studying wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. The other two times that are in there it's saying that you need to have a knowledge like a scientific knowledge. You need to, to see God in the, in, in the world, see God in the creation. You should have two types of knowledge. One where you discern the magnitude, the majesty, the glory of God. That's in there four times. And one time it's in there where... You need to see the attributes of God. As if you were making a scientific investigation of what God has done and what God has created. And it says, if you're willing to do this, it says you won't be barren, you won't be unfruitful. And the knowledge that you gain, the discernment that you have of God. And see, what you're doing right now is gaining a knowledge of God. Because God and his word are one. Jesus is the living word. Our Bibles are the written word. And when we read aloud or speak God's word aloud, it is the spoken word. And all three have the same power. The power to deliver, the power to heal, the power to prosper, the power to give you peace. Great, awesome power. The power to change your life. And I don't mean in a religious way. I mean in a way that far surpasses anything that religion has ever offered you. 
Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go in to and look at some of these slides that, that, uh, that we have and realize as, uh, as we go into these slides, it's something that I want you to realize. And, and uh, the Lord Jesus told us this in Matthew 16, 17. I'm going to read this from the Amplified Bible. It said, Then Jesus answered him, Blessed, happy, fortunate, and to be envied are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood men have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I want you to see that what you're studying in your Bible study when we go through God's Word and we look at these different scriptures you're studying God's Word, and God's Word is understood through your spirit as the Holy Spirit reveals the Word to you and reveals the meaning and the understanding of the Word. The Word of God is not mentally understood. It is something that is revealed. It's called revelation knowledge. Jesus went on to t tell uh, Peter, he said, Simon Barjona, he said, you're a blessed man. He said, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father who is in heaven, he's saying, you learn this through revelation knowledge. And what you study, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but what you study when you're studying the epistles and the letters written by the Apostle Paul and the other writers of the Bible, it's all revealed knowledge, revealed information. St. Peter wrote about some of the things that he saw, but the truth of what he was saying, the understanding of what he was saying, had to be revealed to him. That's why Jesus said, flesh and blood, men didn't teach you this, Peter. He said, but my Father who is in heaven, he has revealed this to you. Let me read a few scriptures that aren't in your notes that uh, address this. This first one is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. And I used to, oh, I love this verse 9 when I found it in the scriptures. It says, but, it, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. I love the Lord, and I started dreaming about the the things that I was going to see, the colors that, that I haven't seen, the, the sounds and pitches and tones that I've never heard, the music in a way that I've, I've never heard. It. And I just went on dreaming about these wonderful things that eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. And then the Holy Spirit pointed out to me, so, well, read the 10th verse. And the 10th verse says, but God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. All of these things that I was thinking were going to come in the hereafter are here now. You can see the wonders of the world through the eyes of God as he reveals them to you. So, let me read that again. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. God's not a liar if he says he's revealed them unto us. Guess what? He's revealed them unto us. Maybe we need to take off the spiritual blinder so that we can see what has been revealed to us. And he does it all through his word. He lets you see the beauty of our Lord and our Savior. He lets you see his beauty. And it's all through revelation knowledge. Here's another one in Galatians 1 verses 11 through 12. It says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's called the Pauline Revelation. God revealed these books in these scriptures to him. He didn't go to any man. He didn't go to Peter. He didn't go to John. He didn't, he didn't go to any of the apostles to find out the information 
that he's shared with us by way of the Holy Spirit. God reveals this word to you. He told, he told us in the book of Hebrews, he says, you have no need that any man teach you. He said, you have one to teach you. And that one is the Holy Spirit. Now he teaches through men, but you don't give me the praise for the teaching. You praise the Lord. I am just a mouthpiece. I didn't write any of these scriptures I'm sharing with you. The Lord pointed them out to me. And I'm sure he wants me to point them out to you. So to God be the glory. Well, if you understood that, that in and of itself, maybe I, we have time. Let me share with you about this glory. You know, it, it's almost like you read the scriptures and it's always to God be the glory. God gets all the glory. God gets the glory. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Well, he does that for your benefit. See, when you read about the glory, you find out that glory is something heavy and it's weighty and it's, it's spectacular, it's beautiful, it's like gold. And the weight of gold is very heavy, it's very burdensome to try to carry a large amount of gold. The same way it's very burdensome to carry a lot of amount of glory. And what glory does to men, it weighs them down. And it weighs them down with pride. That's why scripture tells us pride comes before the fall. You're going to fall under the weight of the glory. Now here's the beauty of our Father, our Lord, and the Holy Spirit. If you are willing to give God the glory, He will make sure that you receive all of the wealth, the praise, the admiration that men will give to you. They'll praise you. They'll, they'll, they'll lavish things on you. And God says, you can keep all the money, keep the glory. He said, I'll let you shine. I'll let you have the radiance of the glory. But don't you carry it yourself. He said, you give it to me and I will illuminate you with my glory. I'll let you stand out. I'll let you have. He has no need of the money. He has no need of the goods. He has no need of any of it. But he knows that trying to carry the weight of glory will cause your destruction. That's why it's, it's so good just watching athletes sometimes. And some of them know they hit a home run and they immediately point up to the sky it's a, they're saying, I give the glory to you, Father. Thank you, God. Thank you for letting me do this. Thank you for letting me have, have the, the skill and giving me the way to do this and to get all of the, this wealth playing a game. And they're giving away the That's wisdom. That's the way you want to be. God doesn't, I want to say it again, God doesn't mind you keeping the cash, but give him the glory. He said, if you glorify me, I will glorify you. So let him shine his light on you and pass the light, the glory that men give to you. You pass it on to your heavenly father. Well, let me finish reading these two scriptures and then we'll go to the slides. In Galatians 1, 15 and 16, says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb, this is the Apostle Paul writing again, and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathens immediately, he said, I conferred not with flesh and blood. He's letting you know, he's, he didn't get this from any men. And he didn't know it before he taught it. He's passing the glory on to God. And let's go to our slides. Let's see. Now, like I said, we're going to be going through these.
like I said, we're going to be going through these. And this is our first slide. And I have scriptures that we're going to relate to these, these slides. And this is just, uh, uh, we want, what are we getting? A knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we see this first slide, we, we getting a, we're going to get a picture of creation and what happened and what God wants for you as we go through the slides, what he wants for your life. We see in this slide, we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see three separate entities, but it's only one God. You have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, this is really important for you to understand because God made you to be just like Him. And so you are also, it's only one of you, but you have three separate parts that are addressed in the Scriptures. You are a spirit. You have a soul and you live in a body. It's called a tripartite being, a three-part being. That's you. Why? Because you were made in the image and the likeness of God. Now, the reason I didn't put you on this slide, because if you want to know what you're like, you're just like God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You say, well, how, how is that? God made you in His image and in His likeness. So if you want to know what you're supposed to be, what God created you to be, He created you to be what? Just like Him. Now, God is so good that when, in the beginning, when he created Adam, he walked and talked with Adam, it says in the cool of the day in the book of Genesis. He created a helpmeet for Adam. And they were so much alike and so much like God that they were both named Adam. It wasn't Adam and Eve, it was Adam. God said, Adam... Both of them turned around because that was there. And you can see that in the fifth book of Genesis, fifth chapter, rather, of Genesis. They were both named Eve. I mean, Adam, I'm sorry. They were both named Adam. Adam named Eve after the fall. But when you see this, you always want to remember that when God created that earth, He created it for mankind, not for himself. He created it for you. And he created you to have rule, reign, and dominion over that earth. Now, what happened is Adam was given dominion by God. And then Adam... got prideful. He listened to Satan. See, pride comes before the fall. Why is Adam listening to a snake? Adam had authority over the snake. Adam named the snake. Adam knew what the snake was. He's the one that named the snake, Snake. Why is he listening to the snake? Because the snake tempted him. The snake told him something that caused Adam to desire something that he thought would make him 
like God. Now, we know the scriptures tell us that Adam was created in the image and likeness of God. But when the snake came to him and deceived him, he conspired with the snake. There's a conspiracy going on to get this that would make him more like God. Just thinking this would make him independent of God. And so the conspiracy was, this is a horrible conspiracy. I don't know if you've ever realized it, but wasn't Adam told that the day he eat the fruit of that tree, he would surely die? Yes, he was told that. So here, Adam, he wasn't standing up as a man the way God designed him to stand up. From the moment he let Satan, the snake, start talking to his woman. He's standing right there. And the snake is blowing smoke at his woman. And he didn't say a thing. He didn't stop him. In fact, he let the snake entice his woman, his helpmeet, to eat from the tree. Well, wait a minute. I, I want you to give this some thought. Didn't God tell Adam that the day he ate from that tree, he was going to die? I just picture these things in the Word of God. And I picture Adam watching his wife, watching his helpmeet, eat from this tree. I, I, I just believe that Adam didn't eat right away. See, he had already fallen. He just, at once he made the decision, he had fallen. He hadn't consummated it yet. But I wonder, I think at a minimum of 20 minutes watching, walking around Eve to see if she's going to fall over dead. How sick. You let your wife eat something that you've been told by God would kill them? What's going on with man? What's going on with Adam? And finally, Adam ate of the tree. And see, the half lie that Satan told Adam then came in immediately, came into effect the truth of what God had told him. He said, you're going to surely die. At that moment, the moment he ate of that fruit, he died. He went from being living in a body. It wasn't eternal, but it was designed to last forever. And he immediately started the process of dying. But see, Satan told him a half-truth, which is a whole lie. Satan told him, says, God knows the day that you eat of that tree, you're going to be just like him. Well, didn't God make him in his image and in his likeness? Yes, he did. But we said this last week, it sounds comical, but I want you to remember this. It's a good way to remember it. God told Adam everything that Adam knew. God didn't tell Adam everything that he knew. Now, I want you to see this in the scripture. So, so you've got a Bible there. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. And this is after all of this had taken place. And in uh, verse 22, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're all there. And this is what God the Father said. Verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us. Is become 
He says he's in a condition now that he wasn't in before. He was made in my image and in my likeness. But I didn't tell him everything. What was it that Adam didn't know? See, this shows the love of God for his creation and for mankind. From the very beginning, you know what it was that God didn't tell Adam? He didn't tell him about evil. I like that. I like the fact that God himself, as you read through the scriptures, said he never knew the depths. God himself said this. He never knew the depths of evil. And I like that about God. I don't picture setting God setting up for eternity, figuring out how far evil we go. Adam could have found out everything he wanted to know about evil, or the Bible calls it calamity, and it is calamitous. He could have just asked his father. I'm sure God would have told him whatever he needed to know about calamity or about evil. But pride caused Adam to fall. To fall for the half-truth, which was a whole lie. And that's why the scripture tells us there's nothing in this world that Satan uses to deceive you except the lust of the eyes. They saw the fruit that it was good and pleasant to eat, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And it was pride. See, Eve looked at it and said, the fruit, of oh, it looks good to me. I've got to taste good. The lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. But what Adam was dealing with was the pride of life. And pride comes before the fall. So here we are today. Thank God for Jesus. Because he came and did what God had wanted from the beginning. He redeemed us. He redeemed you. He redeemed me. He had to shed his blood to do it. It cost God everything. It cost him his son. You know, when Abram was going to sacrifice Isaac and God told him, take your son, your only son, the son whom thou lovest, and take him up there and sacrifice him. Uh, God was obligating himself to sacrifice his son, Jesus. When Abram was willing to go and sacrifice, Abraham was willing to go and sacrifice his son, Jesus wouldn't ask you he didn't ask Abram or Abraham to do anything that he wouldn't do. So when Abraham agreed to sacrifice his son, and God made it, it almost sounds like God's playing the dozen with him when he says, hey, Abraham, take your son, your only son, the son whom you lovest. Take him up there and sacrifice him. And Abraham loved God enough and trusted God enough that he said, if I kill this boy, God's got to raise him from the dead or do something because he promised me that out of this boy that he wants me to sacrifice is going to come uh, uh, more people than there are grains of sand on, on, on the earth. But Abraham was willing to do it. And God obligated himself. We can never, no man can ever obligate God. But God obligated himself to sacrifice his own son the same way Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son. So what happened is man fell. And this is what man's, let's go to the next slide. And we'll see. 
Well, before we leave this slide up, no, we'll go to the next slide. I'll share that with you later. Let's see if we can get ourselves to the next slide. So our next slide, we see men after the fall of Adam and Eve. And we see that man is a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. And here he is in a condition that he's in the world with no God and no hope. The scripture beneath the slide is from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. It's a real important scripture for you to know that it's there. Because this gives you tools to use when you're dealing with when you're dealing with religious people. They want you to follow religion. Your Heavenly Father wants you to follow His Word and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Religious people want to build up followers after themselves. And there's so many scriptures on that, we're not even going to get started there. I'll spend the rest of the evening on that one thing. But here we see man in the world, in the scripture beneath that says, this is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, says, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. That was the state of mankind. He had no hope. How much hope? None. You don't see God anywhere in that picture. Man is in the world, what? But he has no God. You don't see God in the picture. And he has no hope. What a terrible position to be in. Now, you share this with you and you get an understanding of the, of, the, of, the, of the scriptures and what happened through the course of the scriptures. At that point in time, you would say that man was a Gentile. All mankind were Gentiles. That's a group of people, and that would include all mankind that were in the world having no hope and without God. Now what happened, God chose a group of Gentiles. He chose them to work through, to bring about salvation through Christ Jesus. And this group of Gentiles is known from the scriptures as the commonwealth of Israel. Only this group that he chose, that's why they're called God's chosen people. They weren't chosen because they were special. In fact, the scripture says God chose them because they were the most hard-headed, stiff-necked people on the face of the earth. God didn't want to work with an easy group. He wanted to work with a group of people that were hard-headed and they're set in their ways and stiff-necked. They weren't, they weren't going to just be easily turned. God says, no, I'm going to take the hardest group to work with and I'm going to bring about bringing in Jesus the Christ through that group of people so that I can bring salvation to the whole world and the Gentiles will no longer say they're in the world having no hope and without God in the world, because he is coming back. Yeah. And so, here's man in this terrible state because, because, because of uh, pride. And I just want you to see, these scriptures are in your notes. If you bother to download those notes before the lesson, you'll have them in your hand. If you print them out, if not, they're in a PDF file. You don't have to print them out. They'll just be right on your screen. 
They're not large files. In Romans 1.28, this is talking about the Gentile world. It says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which were not convenient. This is the state of mankind. They didn't want to even remember God. See, from Adam, Adam knew God, and Adam descendants knew God. And the further you got away from Adam in the garden knowing God, the more men forgot about God. The more mankind forgot about God. Mankind did not want to retain God in their knowledge because God had rule and reign over Adam when he was in the garden. And so here's mankind trying to erase God from their, from, from their knowledge. That same thing is going on now, church. If you look around you, what do they take prayer out of the schools? They have laws preventing churches from dealing in politics so that they couldn't get God-fearing people involved in running the government. They didn't want to, and they don't want to today, retain God in their knowledge. That's why you've been given an awesome task, an awesome assignment, to go into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. The blessing is for you today. The blessing for me today. We can spread the gospel by doing what we're doing right now. You know, I, I look on, on Facebook and on YouTube, and I will see someone that has a picture of maybe a monkey chasing a dog. I'm making this up. And it might have six million views. And God has given you a weapon and a tool to fight Satan because through sharing the gospel through social media, you can take this gospel, you alone can start it off just by each one reaching one. And you can see that this gospel goes around the world to virtually billions of people. Just you. You say, what can I do? You can reach one. You can reach one who will reach one. And you don't have to go out and preach on the corner anymore. Could you just share the word of God with one person? You think, oh, I've got 60 friends, I've got 100 friends, I've got 1,000 friends on Facebook. I've got another 1,000 friends on Twitter. Oh, and I still belong to MySpace and to Daily Motion, Pinterest. What are some of the others? LinkedIn? Are you linked in to doing what God wants you to do? Can you share the word of God with business people? Yes, you can. You can do what you can do. And I know God is not unjust. He's not unrighteous. And he would never ask us to do something we couldn't do. And I don't mean to offend anyone, but I know way too many Christians, way too many brothers and sisters in Christ, that if they were honest, they'd tell you they've never once led one person to the Lord. Never once shared the gospel with someone and led them to the Lord. Now look how easy it is. But God has made it for us. 
you could have invited someone to watch this live Bible study and got them to pray along with you. Let's pray that prayer that they prayed at the beginning. I'm going to pray it again at the end. Not too late. Call someone up. Get them to pray with you. Say, hey, someone's going to pray on, on Facebook. I want you to pray with with me as I pray with them. How much easier could God have made it for our generation? We can set up in our bunny slippers and in our house and text someone. Don't even have to talk to them. Text someone and tell them. Tune into this. We're going to pray together. Come on, church, we can spread this gospel all around the world. I went online the other night, and you know, there are three billion people that use Facebook. That's not even counting any of those other mediums of social media that we can use now. It's a tool. That's all, a tool. And at the same time, I'm telling you, you'll never be more fulfilled than to lead someone to the Lord and know that you've changed their eternal destiny. And that one person that you lead to the Lord might lead a hundred million to the Lord. Just that one person. Because you took the time to share the love of God with them. Well, let's, 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 let's go on. We're talking about the state of man after the fall. And this is, uh, you know, when we prayed at the beginning of the, of the, uh, prayed the salvation prayer at the beginning of the Bible study, we did that because of this scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. And it has to do with the slide that we're looking at right now. It says, but the natural man, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned, spiritually understood. And this is what Jesus, he promised, this isn't in your notes, but this is what Jesus did when, when he said, uh, uh, in Matthew 16, 17, Jesus answered him, Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied of you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not, has not, have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Revelation knowledge. This is how we learn and understand the Word of God. It's revealed to us by the Holy Spirit, to our spirit. It's understood in a way that uh, uh, the mind, independent of the spirit, will never receive it, can't understand it. That's why it says no discernment in our human mind, but there is in our spirit. So you have a mind of the spirit and you have a mind of the flesh. Now, I want to just point out something to you. I'm going to go back to this first, uh, this first slide. In the beginning, God. You see, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Now, I just want to make a point to you about what, what happens with religion. And what happens when the Holy Spirit reveals things to you? Now, there's a saying that I have heard and a question that I've heard asked at almost every funeral I have attended. One of the questions that I hear on a regular basis is, how old was he or how old was she? And if the answer is 72 or 74 or 75 or 80, I hear this reply. Well, they got their three score and 10, meaning three scores, 60 and 10 is 70 years old. So they made it to 70. So this is like 
this is the finish line. This is where we're supposed to get. I mean, if we make it to 70, we got our share. Well, that's a lie straight out of the pit of hell. Let me show you where that comes from. That comes from the 90th Psalm. And if you look at the 90th Psalm, in verse 1, it tells you, I have it here, it says, A prayer of Moses, the man of God. We're going to continue this. This is where we're going to take up next week. You want to, you want to hear this? It's important because it has to do with your lifespan and the state of your health as you go through life. You don't want your life governed by a lie, but uh, I need to ask, were, were there any questions that came across that uh, we have? There are no questions that we have that we need to answer. Okay, then we have perfect time. <laughs> Because what we want to do is make sure we do what we did when we first came on. We want to make sure that if you do have someone that you happen to call, and you do have someone, could be your children, one of your children, one of your adult children, or your children that's old enough to understand and have reached the age of reason. And you want to make sure that they get saved. You want to make sure that they receive salvation. Well, it's as easy as asking them to just come and pray along with you. Oh, what a great blessing to know that your children are saved, that your husband or your wife is saved, that your neighbor, your friend is saved. And the way we receive salvation is by confessing Jesus as Lord. Not confessing our sins. It doesn't say anything about confessing your sins. But it does say in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 9, it says that if we will confess Jesus as Lord, and that if we will believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, it says that we'll be saved. It says, with your mouth you make a confession unto salvation. And with your heart, you believe on the right standing with God. So what we want to do is we want to do what the scripture says. So let's just do that. I'll lead because I've memorized the scriptures. And I'll lead if you'll just pray along with me. What we're going to do, this is called praying the scriptures. We're going to do it the way God said to do it. If it doesn't work the way he said to do it, I don't know what will work. But I know this will work because God is not a man that he should lie. So just follow after me. God, I come to you. I come to you according to your word. Your word says, the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 9, that if I will confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead, that I shall be saved. God, right now, with my mouth, I confess that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. So according to your word, with my mouth, I've made a confession unto salvation. And with my heart, I have believed unto right standing with you. For your word says that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And right now, I'm calling on the name of Jesus for my salvation. So I thank you, Father, that I shall be saved. And I thank you in the name of my Lord, my God, my Savior, and my King, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, until next week, this is Pastor Stewart saying good night.